Hi, I'm Len Wein, co-creator of Wolverine, and I'm sitting here with the living legend himself, Stan the Man Lee. We're here to talk about the origins of the X-Men and Wolverine and all of that sort of good stuff. Wow, well that was a great introduction, and now I'm waiting for you to say the first thing that'll give me my cue to wax eloquent. Well, fair enough. Uh, none of us would be here at all if you and Jack Kirby had not created the X-Men and did handle those first bunch of issues. Tell us how that came about. I had been doing so many superheroes and getting superpowers, you know, a guy who was the strongest character on earth and somebody who could fly and somebody who could stretch his body and so forth. The toughest thing is coming up, as you know, with Absolutely. new superpowers. So one day I decided to take the cowardly way out. I figured instead of having to explain their origins and how they got their powers, I'd make up a lot of crazy powers and say they were born that way. They were mutants. No explanation needed. Mm -hmm. No being struck by lightning or bitten by a radioactive weasel or anything. Just they got a power. And lo, the X-Men were born. And that's it. And I, I have never been more dull in my life. <laughs> Well, did, did you work closely with Jack? You had on so many other projects. Couldn't have done it without Jack. Jack is the most was the most imaginative person I have ever known. He was not only an artist, but he was a storyteller. And he told the stories visually through his drawings. And, for example, when we first created the X-Men and I said, I want them to be at a school, we'll have a professor. The, na the name of the professor will be Professor Xavier, because I'm so corny. I said, that'll tie in with the X of X-Men. And um, Professor Xavier teaches them how to handle their superpowers and everything. And Jack brought in the first few pages, and they're all fighting each other, which is a wonderful way to start a story. But I said, what are they fighting about? And and he said, no, they're exercising. I decided they should have a room where they exercise. I thought that was great, so we decided to call it the danger Absolutely. room. But I never would have done that unless Jack had given me those drawings, you know? So he was the greatest collaborator you could ever have. Now, as I recall, you had a shorter run on X-Men probably than any of the other books that you and Jack did together. I, you, know, you did Thor for years, you did the FF for 100 issues. Uh, why did you leave the X-Men book? I can't remember th completely, but I think what happened was we never thought the X-Men book was quite as important as the others. Jack only had time to do so many. He was doing the FF and Thor and I think the Hulk or whatever. So I finally got another artist to do the X-Men. And somehow I wasn't as happy working with the other artist. But the book was still selling well enough to keep it going. So I stopped writing it, got another writer, and the book kept going, and I turned my attention to other things, and uh, that's really what happened. And it didn't sell quite as well until a new group took it over, and I wouldn't be surprised if you were part of that new group. Oh, segues. I love segues. <laughs> that's some segue, huh? <laughs> Did you expect the X-Men would still be going today, even as a completely evolved and different creature? I never, would guys have, I never would have thought that any of them would still be around today or as big and important as they are today. That's really the, the most amazing thing of all and, and, and the most gratifying thing, of course, and only because the people who took over the writing and the drawing later did such a great job that they not only kept the strips going, but they improved on them as they went along by making up characters like, oh, shall we say, Wolverine? Wolverine actually was not created initially to be one of the X-Men. That's the Really? Part. I didn't know that. No, no, I, I created Wolverine uh, for the Hulk. For give him somebody to fight because God knows you have 12 How could the Hulk fight Wolverine? He could step on him and crush him. Except he's indestructible. Oh, Wolverine. That's right. That's right. That's how you play it. Wow. But uh, no, I mean, he became part of the X Men because there was all that scuttlebutt going around about reviving the X Men as the mm -hmm. international superhero group. 
So I figured, oh, a Canadian, let's make him a mutant. One of the things that's always sort of bothered me about the X-Men, and I don't think you intended it, but it became the situation, is that your whole idea of, well, if I just make a mutant so I don't have to come up with origins, everyone started to do that. It was simply, I'm a mutant. Okay, that's one panel, we're done. Now let's do a story. Well, speaking of origins, he says, because he realizes that Len has been talking longer than him, and he will never tolerate that. <laughs> so speaking of origins, I think that the origin that you gave Wolverine is one of the most brilliant origins ever, and one of the most provocative and mystifying, and it kept the readers on the edge of their seats for I don't know how many years, wondering how did it happen? What happened up in Canada? And I mean, it, it was just wonderful the way it, Wolverine almost single-handedly kept people fascinated by that book. I think part of that is the mystery factor. Mm -hmm. I think the less you know about a character, the more interesting they are. You know, mysterious women in black are always much more intriguing than the girl next door who you know everything about. Well, now that depends on the woman, but we can get into that later. That, but I, but I, this, this I, is I a G-rated conversation. I feel the same probably. way about you, you know. I know so little about you that I find you intriguing, and I'm sure as soon as I get to know you better, I mean, will this thing ever end? You know. I'll... I Listen, I have spent decades hiding my mutant powers from you. It's not easy to do. I'm all strapped up here to keep the wings hidden. It's not an easy thing. I guess part of the, the fascination is, is how these characters have evolved over the years. The fact that, that Wolverine and the X-Men have taken yours and Jack's creation in a whole other direction. How do you feel about seeing that sort of thing with, with the X-Men? Well, the way I feel about it, not only with the X-Men, but with all our characters, when characters have been in existence for so many, not years, for so many decades, the writers naturally feel, I've got to inject a new angle, a new element. I've got to do something to keep the reader's interest up. So they make changes. They kill a character off. They make a character ill. They have one marry another, divorce another, become a drunkard, whatever it is, because they're desperately trying to just throw in a new angle that'll grab the readers, and you know that better than anybody. So. I never object to the changes that are made. First of all, I'm not in a position to object. <laughs> but secondly, because I understand why they make them. And um, I, I'd probably, and you'd probably do the same thing. If you were writing the same group of characters year after year, you'd have to say to yourself, I gotta put some surprises mm -hmm. in here and some new twists. Now I think I've spoken as long as your longest speech so I feel better, and now I'll stop and take a break. You're timing this, aren't you? It's, <laughs> it's sad. Uh, I think there's a, there is that element. There's always a natural evolution. I, I get the question. I know I'm sure you've gotten it. How you feel about Do you feel proprietary towards the characters? No, I, I, I really don't. I really don't. I, um, I felt proprietary, as I'm sure you did, toward the characters when I was writing them. No, absolutely. But the minute you stop writing them, somebody else is writing them. And if that somebody doesn't have the freedom to write it the way he or she wants to, then it isn't fair. It isn't right. Um, no, I don't, I don't really have a propri proprietary feeling about it. I think we share that. I'm, I'm sort yeah. of the same way. People ask me that, and I go, I have taken over other people's characters and done things with many of them yours, in fact. Yeah, yeah and I've been and, meaning to talk to you about well, that. Well, probably not on camera. This is not. But... Uh, <laughs> but you you have to allow the fact that these things are, I think you once put it, modern mythos. Mm -hmm. It's it's the legends and the, and the campfire stories of today, and they evolve and grow. They have to. They have to become something new constantly. Uh, and since I've had my hands on other people's pies, I don't think it's fair of me to feel no one else has the right to do that with my character. And I think that's a very honest uh, attitude. You talked earlier about somebody doing a book for years and years and years. I've never done that. I think my longest run on a book was five years on the Hulk. It was probably oh, the longest yeah. I ever stuck with anything. You have a, a, the Fantastic Four you went on for years. Chris Claremont, when he took over the X-Men for me, I think did it for like 17 years. 17 years? Yeah, I, I think he told three different stories at least in the course of Oh, my it. gosh. But I, I found it amazing. Chris 
Chris was one of my editorial assistants when I was editor in chief during the year and a half I had the turn at bat. And I was writing several books a month, and I discovered I really couldn't do that and be editor in chief. You discover yeah. that yourself. You have to start letting go of things. And Chris had a little desk outside of the, the editor in chief's office where he was do proofreading, whatever. And I started having a conversation one day about having to give up a book. I'm, I was doing The Hulk as well, and I think Spidey, and then I was doing the X-Men. I said, you know, something's got to go. I can't do this many books and still run the company, sort of. And, and suddenly from outside, this little voice piped up, me, 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 I'll take over the X-Men. I'll do it like a windmill, the arm waving like crazy to get my attention. I'll, I'll take it. I'm, and I saw such enthusiasm and such, anybody that passionate, oh, they get a shot. So I gave the book to Chris. And, he stayed for 17 years. We couldn't get him off of it. Crowbars, nothing. We couldn't I get him I didn't realize it yeah. was that long. Wow. And he did a great job. He I did. Mean, the X-Men. Everybody who did the X-Men did a great job. Maybe they're easy to write. Maybe I shouldn't be so um, impressed. I don't know. They may be a very easy group to write. Well, if, if that's true. I'm only kidding. Longer. I'm aware. <laughs> Somebody who was positing a few months ago uh, in preparation for the film was 10 things you didn't know about Wolverine. And one of those 10 things was that I had originally intended for Wolverine to be a mutated Wolverine. Not a human being with Wolverine-like powers, but a Wolverine who was evolved by the high evolutionary. You remember well, if him? If somebody said that in a blog, it has to be true. Really? Wow. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't even read blogs because what people say, and if you let it upset you, or if you try to correct the record, you spend your life just doing that. As a rule of thumb, I agree with you. I don't do that. But I don't want to be tagged with that particular <laughs> label. Uh, no, he was always human. I always envisioned Wolverine as a human being or, or a mutant human being with I assume the various that. powers. I always assume I know. That. I, I, but I, let me ask you. Yes. I, I just thought of this. Is he literally a mutant, or is he a human being that something scientific had been done to him to make him the way he was? Has he been altered biologically, or whatever the word would be, which, in which case, maybe he's not a true mutant, because he wasn't born that way. But only you would know I have come to the source. Uh -huh. The answer, actually, is, is yes to both. Uh, he was born a mutant. His original mutant abilities were heightened senses and the healing factor. Oh, he had that when he was born. The healing born. factor comes with the territory. Oh, so and, the and, adamantium the bones, was added. The adamantium is what made him who he is today, the indestructible quality. Oh, I'm he glad could you... heal before, but he wasn't indestructible. I'm glad you clarified that. Uh, I think that's actually in the movie. It was certainly touched on in, in the second or third of the X-Men films, the whole uh, Weapon X project where they took he was the only person on earth I think really you could do it to because of the healing factor. Anyone else would have been killed if you tried well, it. Well, it certainly there. would have been unpleasant. Oh, at the very least, would have ruined their lunch hour. Wolverine could survive the process, and so he did. Wow, that's great. I, I'm so glad you told me because I've wondered for a long time is he a true mutant? But of course. He is a true mutant. If he, he was born with the healing factor, yes, and, and which the made him a mutant. Now, uh, something else that has impressed me greatly. Is there such a thing, because it sounds very authentic, or did you make up the word adamantium? Roy Thomas. It was made up. There is, sadly, no indestructible metal. Uh, everything can be gotten to somehow, but, but it works great in the comics. All right, you, you've seen the first three X-Men movies. So I wouldn't have missed them. Uh, well, you're in them, as I recall. Uh, <laughs> now, you've seen Hugh Jackman and... and What's your take? How do you feel about you as, as Wolverine? I cannot now envision anybody else playing the role. He is so great as Wolverine that, I mean, there are no words. I agree completely. As I said to someone earlier, uh, who would have thought a guy who plays Curly in Oklahoma on Broadway yeah, yeah. could play that character? A song and perfect. dance guy. Uh, you know, went on to play you know, Peter Allen as his next role after that. Right. But he's breathtakingly perfect. There's a wonderful picture. I, I'm about to embarrass my wife. I always talk about uh, of Hugh and myself and my wife at Comic-Con a few years back. And three of us together. And I am smiling at the camera. And Hugh, God love him, is smiling at me. And my wife is looking up at Hugh like he's lunch. <laughs> it's just like he is actually the most 
gorgeous man I have ever met. I was very careful not to have my wife meet him. I you couldn't don't warn have me this, first? I don't have the self-confidence that you do. No, I'm, I just went in blindly and ignorantly as usual. I was always trying to get female readers interested in our books, you know. Good. And the X-Men had a lot of fear. For some reason, the X-Men had great appeal for females as well as guys. I think there's a romance factor to the X-Men yeah, books yeah, that isn't true about that. a lot of the others. Mm -hmm. There's there's all, it's it's one of the great cosmic soap operas. Cyclops, of course, I, I thought it was so perfect to have him in love with one of the girls, but he could never really look her in the eye, so to speak, because he Perfect. couldn't remove his glasses. Mm -hmm. And I felt that was a very dramatic thing that would uh, appeal to our female readers. And, and, and the fact that there are so many characters, it's almost like some of these TV series like uh, Lost or Heroes, mm -hmm. or, you know, you get a lot of interesting characters and you throw them together and see what comes exactly. up. Exactly. When it works, it works wonderfully. Yeah. And thank goodness it's been working. <laughs>